When AOL spent $315 million to acquire the Huffington Post a month ago, the deal raised many questions. The first one was, 350 what? Then came lots of speculation about who won and who lost. But what interested on the media was what the deal meant to the future of journalism and what now to make of this thing, this phenomenal thing, the Huffington Post. The only way to begin, I'm sorry to say, is with everything about the HuffPo that makes traditional journalists want to puke. Be patient. It isn't a short list. Beginning with, HuffPo is kind of yellow. Not cowardly yellow, sensationalist yellow. As I write this piece, the blaring lead headline is, I kid you not, Time is Running Out. Approaching Meteor? No, just a procedural deadline for federal financial reform rules in three months. Last week, they scared the bejeebers out of me with, Texas is burning border to border. The wildfires there did claim a million acres, but at least 99.4% of Texas was unconsumed by flames. And the rest of the layout is pretty bombastic as well. It is a visual presentation that I think might charitably be described as a combination of an old-fashioned afternoon tabloid and a ransom note. Los Angeles Times media critic Tim Rutten. As a longtime detractor, Rutten is one-stop shopping for HuffPo's shortcomings. Item two, aggregation. A large percentage of content on the Huffington Post summarizes and links to material from other publications, providing HuffPo for free what others have paid dearly to produce. Aggregation is the elevation of kleptocracy to a business model. You're simply stealing things that other businesses, other media organizations have paid to gather. Yes, HuffPo redirects traffic to the source, but... Those readers usually make a U-turn right back to HuffPo for more of the web highlights HuffPo then sells advertising against. Putting aside whether this digital age fair use is really fair, Rudin says... People who buy into this notion that information wants to be free, that free information is somehow in the DNA of the web, whatever that means, people who buy into that notion are simply committing themselves to a suicide pact. If that notion prevails in a decade, there won't be any serious journalism to aggregate. Ah, seriousness. Much of HuffPo's traffic is generated thanks to the right rail, filled with what they call click candy. As I write this, the world's ten creepiest abandoned cities, Liz Taylor's last husband speaks out, and the amazing pain-killing properties of olive oil. Indeed, the entirety of the Huffington Post is edited with preferences of the reader very much top of mind. Favoring subjects already trending high in online interest is called search engine optimization. Another term might be auto-pandering. This notion of tailored news is really a form of informational narcissism. Once again, Tim Rutten. It allows you to narrow down the scope of your news consumption to those things you already know or believe you know. And what it doesn't do is let you see the story that you never imagined you'd be interested in and that somehow broadens your perspective, enriches your life, makes you a better citizen, gives you something to think about that afternoon. None of these is a trifling concern, nor are the remaining controversial HuffPo quirks. It's building up a $315 million asset through the labors of unpaid bloggers, and it's pronounced liberal slant, raising questions of journalistic credibility. But let's also consider some other untrifling facts. For one, AOL just paid a third of a billion dollars to shape all of its content in the image of HuffPo founder-in-chief, Ariana Huffington. Why? Because her website draws 38 million unique visitors a month, visitors who don't seem too put off by hyperbolic headlines. AOL expects HuffPo itself to generate $100 million in revenue next year and 30% operating margins. Those are the kinds of numbers newspapers used to generate before they were propelled into a death spiral by the very digital revolution being exploited by websites like HuffPo. Meanwhile, the institution evolves. 
Ariana has been on a hiring binge, bringing in talented reporters and editors from the New York Times, Newsweek, Rutan's own L.A. Times, and elsewhere. The newsroom is now at 200 employees on its way, says founding editor Roy Seacoff, to doubling. And while they will never blanket the field with staff reporters, they will report the news that matters the HuffPo way, through live blogs and tweets, camera phone video, and other tools that turn eyewitnesses into citizen journalists. Roy Seacoff. You know, there's many ways to bear witness. I'm not saying that having seasoned reporters on the ground is not an extraordinarily effective way, and that's great, and I welcome it, and we'll link to it. But I think that there is a bearing witness 2.0. There's other ways of getting stories and finding the truth behind stories. Not to mention the Web 2.0 way of not letting the published story be the end of the story. Other news organizations grudgingly host audience comments. HuffPo assiduously cultivates the commenter community with social media mechanisms for following and becoming a fan of others in the HuffPo sphere. A column about potential GOP presidential aspirant Rick Santorum Thursday evening generated more than a thousand comments in three and a half hours. Shouldn't news organizations learn a business lesson from that? Jeff Jarvis, director of the Tone Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at the City University of New York. How to engage an audience and how to create and engage in a conversation that enables people other than just journalists to talk. If people are spending more time on Huffington Post, what's Huffington doing right that they're doing wrong. Jarvis gets steamed when mainstream journalists sneer at HuffPo, such as when the New York Times' David Carr, upon the release of four Times journalists from armed captors in Libya, mused in a tweet about Ariana trying to, quote, aggregate them back to safety. I don't think that line works anymore when we look at what Andy Carvin at NPR retweets from Libya and Egypt and Tunisia, where the witnesses to these major stories are also putting themselves in harm's way and losing their lives. You know, virtue is not a business model. At least these days, not a profitable one. Maybe that's the source of so much journalistic resentment along the lines of ice men gloomily witnessing the advent of refrigeration. HuffPo's Roy Seacoff isn't unsympathetic, but that doesn't stop him from sticking his glass into the crushed ice dispenser of his Viking. Now, call me a destroyer, but I still would like to get my ice that way as opposed to having the guy haul it up four flights of stairs on his shoulder. Me, I'm not sure what to make of the HuffPo phenomenon. I guess I'm hoping that it becomes the best of both worlds, a robust news-gathering organization that also exploits the knowledge and labors of a hyper-connected community. So, yeah, I'm hoping for the best, but... Also prepared to heed the lead headline that a few hours later replaced Time is Running Out. It was about potential flooding in the Deep South. In giant capital letters, it screamed, Bracing for the Worst. <laughs>